Cool. Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay, but a few things have been changed here with the lights and the screen. So it took a little while to set it up again. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm going to try to keep the lectures more or less relevant to what you should be working um, on, on the iOS project. So I try to keep the order more or less in the same order that you'll proceed for the different tasks. And one of the first things that I recommend doing in this app is actually implementing the user interface. So that's why the lectures this morning are going to focus on a kind of a recap and an overview of layouts on iOS, view programming, and, and things that are relevant there. So particularly, I want to talk about, firstly, views in general, how they're structured, which properties do they have, what does the view hierarchy look like. Then we're going to briefly talk about auto layout. But we have a really long video series on that. And that's, um, auto layout is really something you have to learn for examples and hands-on. So we won't go in detail there, but just touch on some topics. Um, we're also going to talk about size classes. That is nothing that is part of the summer program, but it's really useful if you want to develop apps for multiple devices. So we have an app that runs on iPhone, iPad, uh, maybe in future on a TV. And then it's really good to know about size classes and how to work with them. And lastly, another topic that we didn't touch on during the summer is auto layout in code. So, so far, if you've built iOS apps throughout the summer, you did that in Storyboard um, with Interface Builder and everything done visually. But there are some use cases where it's very helpful to write code for your layout. And so we're going to touch on that a little bit as well. And then there's going to be a second lecture following up right away, since both of them are pretty short, where I'm going to talk about some of the more common UI components that you can use in your apps to actually create layouts. So first, a very brief overview and reminder of what the view hierarchy looks like. Um, views are organized in hierarchies. Every view controller at the top has one root view. On that root view, you add subviews. And these are placed relative to their parent views. That is both relevant for positioning, but also relevant for taking in user input. So if you have touch responses in your app, then if a user tries to attempt to tap on an app, the lowest app in the hierarchy will try to receive that touch. If the touch is within the bounds of that subview, then that subview will receive the touch. If the touch is not within the bounds, then it will be passed up the hierarchy to its parent view. So you can imagine the view hierarchy being the root view and then as many subviews as you wish on top of that. And the subviews are always the ones that will try to receive the touches first. And if, you, if the touch is within the subview, then this will consume it. Let's say that is a button. If the touch is not within the subview, then it will be passed to the super view. And then the super view also has a chance to handle the touch. If no one in the responder chain handles the touch, then the touch just goes unnoticed. Just as a short reminder of how the event cycle here is processed, I've linked to a more extensive document that describes the event delivery chain in views. Another interesting aspect is that we mostly work with UI views, um, which is part of the UIKit framework. But underlying all of the rendering of these views on the screen is implemented with a framework that is called core animation. Um, that is really more important if you want to do some advanced animation stuff, or if you want to work with shadows, if you want to work with rounded corners, all kind of things that manipulate the actual rendering, then you're going to work with the core animation layer. So a UI view is actually just a nice little wrapper on top of that core animation layer. And that core animation layer exposes much, much more properties that are not available through a UI view. Um, you'll probably encounter that, as I said, if you want to work with any kind of visual effects, like rounded corners, shadows, and so on. You can access this core animation layer through the layer property of the view. So if you're curious to see what kind of additional properties you can modify, then take a look at the layer property and the CA layer class. Um, view rendering, you have some control over that as well. So in general, if you use the standard UI components, like say a label or a text field, then the re-rendering of these UI components happens automatically. If you change the text of a label, then it will automatically be redrawn to the screen. But it is not true for custom UI components that you might build. So in general, if you want to re-render things on the screen, you can trigger that through two different methods. Um, but you actually should only call one of them actively. That is the set needs display method. So there are some UI components that don't re-render as soon as the content changes. You'll maybe encounter some of them as you work with more advanced components. And then calling set needs display will tell the component to actually redraw itself on the screen. That means if you implement your entirely own component, 
you mostly will have to implement the set needs to display method and then trigger your rendering code within there again. That's just an interesting side effect uh, or side thing to know about. Um, as I said, most UI components you work with, like labels, buttons, and so on, do that automatically. But internally, at some point, they call set needs display to tell the rendering framework to actually redraw that component. Additionally, you can also override a method called draw rect, and that actually gives you a hook directly into the rendering cycle. So every time a UI component is drawn on the screen, which happens up to 60 times a second, the draw rect method is called, and that is a chance for you to actually write custom rendering code where you can draw lines, draw circles, and so on. So if you extend one of the custom component, uh, one of the existing components, or if you create your own component, you will sometimes use this draw rect method to override it and add additional drawing on top of that. So take a look at the documentation for draw rect. It will give you a good idea of how to basically draw entirely custom code. Some important view properties that you should know about. Um, you probably have dealt with them throughout the Summer Academy content. The first one is the frame of a view. That is just the rectangle and the size and the position of the rectangle in the parent's view. So I have a visualization of that on the next slide. But the frame is the one that you deal with the most of the time. The center is the center of that current view in the parent's view. The bounds is very similar to the frame, but it's actually expressed in the coordinate system of the view itself, not in the parent's view. That basically means that it has the same size as the frame, but typically its position is always at zero, zero. And additionally, this one here is also pretty interesting. You can have a transform on a, on a view, and that allows you to rotate or scale views or to translate them. So that here is often used in combination with animations. If you, for example, want to rotate um, a view by 180 degrees, then you can do that through the transform property. And if you put that into an animation block, then you'll see a, a view that rotates by 180 degrees over a certain period of time. A question? Yes. Um, the remark made was that you can make animations with transforms. As I just mentioned, it's basically, um, you said it's a matrix that you can apply, and it allows you to rotate, scale, translate, all kind of things that you can do with math. So pretty cool for custom animations. Here, a brief visualization of what a frame and a bound looks like. So let's say this blue here is a sub view and the gray is the parent view. Then you can see that the frame here is offset by 10, 15, because that is the position inside of the parent view. And the bounds are exactly the same size as the frame, but because they're expressed in the coordinate system of this blue view here, they have an origin, a position of 0, 0. So typically, you don't have to really deal with the bounds. You mostly will use the frames. Uh, but in some cases, it can be useful to know that the bounds is expressed in the local coordinate system. And that's why the position is mostly 0, 0. Cool. Auto layout. What is auto layout? Um, so the few properties that I just talked about, the frame, the center, and so on, these days, when you write iOS layout code, you actually don't set these properties on your own anymore. Back then, in the days when I started, there was no auto layout. That means you had to calculate positions manually, and then you would set frames, and you would set center properties. But now we use auto layout. Um, auto layout is basically replaces that manual frame calculation for almost all cases. And it does that by allowing you to define constraints. So instead of setting a position to 500, 200, you say, I want this to be in the center of the parent view, and I want it to be half as big as the parent view. And I want it to be 50 offset by the bottom of the parent, and maybe 100 offset by another view. So you basically describe relations between different views and, and, and constraints. And then you let auto layout calculate the actual frames based on these constraints. So instead of setting the frame, you define the relationships. Then auto layout will calculate the frames and set them for you. We have a really cool video series. I think it lasts in total over almost two hours uh, because that's a really, really complex topic. So if you haven't worked with auto layout extensively before, I would recommend you at least going through the first hour of that video series that I've linked at the end of this lecture. And it will help you, um, through practical examples, understand how auto layout works. One of the things not covered there, um, at least in detail, are size classes. Size classes are new since iOS 8. And they have been introduced to help you address different screen sizes. 
So in the past, a lot of developers would basically try to detect the current device type and have specific rendering code for each of the, the devices. So we'd see encode, like, if iPhone, do this, if iPad, do this. But at some point, this kind of um, got out of hand because a lot of different devices with different de orientations have been added. And also, Apple has the philosophy that you should not consider the device type, but you should actually consider the relative screen size of the device because they want to be able to add different devices in future. And there also are some use cases where a certain device type might change its size class. Um, a very new example is on iPad. I don't know if you watched the keynote, but there's a new feature on iPad that allows for multitasking. That means you can watch, you can basically use two apps side by side. And if you now have an iPad in portrait mode and you use two apps side by side, then the size you have is very, very slim. So the size class that Apple uses there is basically the same one that is used for an iPhone. So the layout on both apps will look like on an iPhone so that you can see them side by side and still use them in a, in a useful manner. And Apple is going to add more and more of these specific kind of layout situations where you shouldn't make assumptions about the device type, but you should just think about these size classes. And then basically if Apple adds any kind of different multitasking features or other, other types of features, then your app will work um, based on the current size that is available to it. So the size classes, um, I won't go super much into details, but they have different names for different typical sizes. There's a regular size that is used on iPhone. There is a large size that is used for iPad. But the same large size is also used, for example, for an iPhone 6 Plus, which is a very, very large device. So the iPhone 6 Plus is considered to have the same height as an iPad. So you can read into size classes, but the cool part about them is that you can define different layout constraints for specific size classes. So you can say, I want to apply certain constraints only um, in a specific size class. And one example here is in a default layout, I have a search bar at the top, then I have a table view, and then I have a map view below it. And then I say I want to alternate this layout if I have an iPad or if I have a device that has a regular width and a default height. So if I have a wider device than usually, then I actually want to place the search bar on the left and the table view on the left, and then the map view next to these two uh, views on the side here. So instead of placing the stuff below each other, I'm placing it next to each other because I have more width available. Question or remark? Why is it called regular width? Like the naming is very confusing to me. Uh, I didn't use it that much yet. I think they maybe want to keep, keep it open to have even larger things in the future. So that's why regular width is now the wider one. Any width is the default. And yeah, the naming is a little bit confusing, but once you read, you see a visualization of the documentation, it will, be, it will be clear to you. The more important concept is there are some name sizes. Some of these name sizes are somehow mapped to certain devices in certain orientations, and that allows you to make use of different amount of space that is available to you. So if you want to build apps that run on multiple devices, it really makes sense to think of how can I change the design if there is more space available? And using storyboard and size classes, it's really fast to adopt to that. So short summary of what this looks like in storyboard. Um, you can basically select one of the size classes that you currently want to design for at the bottom. There's a bottom bar. And then you get to choose from this 9 by 9 grid. And then you also don't have to remember the names of the things, because you can just choose a grid that lasts over a width of 2 and a height of 3. And you'll basically see the different device sizes. And once you have selected that, you see a blue button bar in Interface Builder. And that will describe the current size class that you have selected. For example, width currently is regular, and the height is currently any. And then any design changes that you make, any constraints that you add, any views that you move around, while the status bar here is blue, these will only apply to that specific size class. So there will be a different set of constraints for that size class, and another set of constraints for the default size class. And you have another way of seeing that when you inspect the details of a view. You can basically see the different constraints. And you have a chance to see which constraints are applied for which specific size classes by looking at constraints. And if they are only for a specific size class, then there will be a prefix here. Here you can see with regular height any, the size should be 20. For the default size class, the size of this constraint should be 0. 
So these are just the different places where you can see that constraints are currently applied to different size classes. Yeah. Yes, you, you can also change the position with size classes. Basically, any change you want to do to your layout, if you want to do it for a specific um, size, you should do it based on size classes. You can also change the color based on size classes. I, well, actually, you maybe cannot. No, because it's not a constraint. I misspoke. But you could do that in code. Which brings us to the next point. Um, so auto layout can also be done in code. In most cases, you should be using Interface Builder because that's really the easiest way to visualize the changes that you made. But sometimes when you have a super dynamic UI where the user can interact with it and the layout changes drastically based on these interactions, it can be necessary that you actually use code for your layout. The easiest way to um, basically add some auto layout code is to define the constraints in Interface Builder and then just modify these constraints in code. So let's say you have some kind of status bar at the top that you can expand and collapse, and you want to change that for a button tap, then you can add a reference to this constraint into code. In this case, it's called height constraint. Then you can access a property called constant, and then you can change that property when the button is tapped. So you can change the size of this constraint from, say, 100 to 300, and that will make the, the view expand. That is the easiest way of changing things. The funny anecdote here is that the only thing you can change about layout constraint in code is the constant. Um, so the only changeable variable aspect is the constant, which is kind of also, again, an interesting way of naming things. Um, but it means that any other thing you want to change about a constraint, there are a lot of other properties that constraints have. You cannot just simply change by adding one or two lines of code. The more complex alternative is having different sets of constraints and then activating or deactivating them based on the state that your UI is currently in. As part of the summer lectures, I have an example of this. But basically, you can create different sets of constraints for saying my, uh, my view will look like this in state one, and it will look differently in state two. Then you activate all of the constraints of state one in Interface Builder. You deactivate all of the constraints for the second state. And then in code, you have references to all of the constraints. And then when a button is tapped, you say, I take my constraints for the, uh, for the second state, and then I'm going to um, activate all of these consta uh, constraints at once. And then basically you switch between state A and B by activating and deactivating all the constraints that belong to them. Another alternative way is actually creating entirely new constraints in code and just adding them on top. But essentially, if you have existing constraints, you can only modify the constant. For anything, additionally, you will either have to dynamically add constraints in code or pre-create all the constraints in Interface Builder and then switch between them. So another alternative that you can work with when you work with auto layout in code, because creating constraints has a very verbose API where you have like 20 different uh, arguments that you have to hand in for every constraint, you can also use Apple's visual format language. There are not a lot of people that actually like to use it, but I wanted to point it out for uh, completeness, but essentially what it allows you to do is create such a string here where you can visually describe the distance between different views and then the constraints based on this text here will be created automatically. So here I'm trying to describe a vertical distance of 200 to the parent view between a view called red view and the parent view and a vertical distance of 100 between the bottom of red view and the parent view. So yeah, if you have developers that like to work with that, um, you can use it, but not a lot of people I know actually use it. A better alternative, in my personal opinion, is using third-party libraries out there. There are like five or six different libraries that make it easier to write auto layout code. Uh, one example here is Cartography, uh, which I like quite a lot. A short example of a thing where you want to constrain the the width and the height of a view to 100 and center it in the parent view, you can basically do that here in three lines of code. So the cool thing is you can say view1.center equals equals view.superview.center, and that basically establishes a constraint between the view and its parent view, instead of having like a line of code that has eight arguments. That is just one of the libraries, and yeah, there are 10 out there. You can try them out. You can read through them and see which ones you like the most. 
but it's mostly recommended to use one of these libraries instead of using the native API because it's just is very, very long, uh, the code that results from using it. Um, similarly, as for drawing on the screen manually, you can also trigger layout cycles manually. So typically, all the layout cycles are triggered automatically and you don't have to deal with it. But if you write auto layout code and you for some reason need to have the layout updated immediately, you can do that in two different ways. The first one is you call set needs layout. And that means that if you will know that it has to re-layout and it will do that before it is drawn to the screen the next time. That can be useful if you have, again, some kind of custom component and you want to change the content of that. Maybe you change the text that is inside of it and the text is bigger, so now the view has to change its size, then you inform the view that it needs to be layouted again. You can also call layout if needed. Layout if needed will actually trigger the layout immediately. It will not wait until the next rendering cycle. And there are some very rare use cases for that, but one of them can be that you need to know the new size of that view immediately. So let's say you add a text to the view, you know it has to be resized, and for some reason, for some additional calculation, you need to know what the new size of that view is going to be after it has been re-layouted. Then you can call layout if needed. It will be layouted immediately, and you'll, get, you'll be able to read the new size of the frame. But typically, it's not recommended to use this here often because you trigger an entirely new layout cycle, and that takes, uh, takes a performance hit. So if you do that a lot, then your app will slow down. Um, a last thing about customizing layouts, if you actually have a use case where auto layout is not good enough or where it's very complicated to express your layout using auto layout, then you have a chance of manually positioning uh, subviews in your custom views by overriding a layout subviews method. That's where you could actually just change the views of the subviews of your current view. So let's say you have a view that has two labels. For some reason, you want to position them manually, not using auto layout. Then you would override layout subviews and you would change the frames of these views within that method. That is the only place where you should be doing that. OK. Uh, additional resources that you should be looking at are the view programming guide provided by Apple. That's just a multi-page document that describes all the essentials of how views are rendered, which different methods you can and should override. And if you haven't done a lot of auto layout, as I said, I highly recommend taking a look at the Make School video series on auto layout. And now I'm going to switch to the second presentation that belongs to this one.